Inside of You is brought to you by my good friends at Sonos. I say good friends because I've been using Sonos products long before they were a sponsor, 18 years before they were my sponsor. I love the Sonos. I have it all throughout my house. I could play a different song in each room of the house. I could play a, Ryan, I could play some Mazzy Star just to chill in my bedroom. I could play some Duran Duran uh, in the living room. Maybe the outside, I could have a party mode. There's so much you could do with Sonos. And it's just, they're, they're beautiful, subtle pieces of, of sound equipment, if you will. Uh, you know, many are just the speaker itself. So you, all you need is a speaker to resonate throughout the room with a beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. uh, they have really designed these things amazingly. Uh, Sonos Roam is the ultra portable smart speaker. This new Roam speaker. Have you heard of this, Ryan? Uh, yes. Well, the Sonos Roam is the ultra portable smart speaker that allows you to bring the Sonos experience everywhere you go. Roam weighs less than a pound, folks, and its premium durable design makes it a perfect perfect asset for the home and for on the go. So when you're home, Roam connects to your Wi-Fi network and the rest of your Sonos system and then automatically pairs with your phone on Bluetooth when you're on the go for a seamless experience. Using automatic true play tuning, Roam smartly adapts to your surroundings and whatever you're listening to and creates sound that's astonishingly detailed and perfectly balanced. Control Roam using the app, Apple AirPlay 2, or your voice with Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. With Sonos, you can start with one speaker and expand your system over time like I did. All Sonos speakers connect over Wi-Fi, so you can group speakers in different rooms and play music, like I said, throughout your entire home. Sonos is wonderful. If you haven't tried it, it's 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 the gift that keeps on giving, and it's the holidays now. And I trust me, you're going to thank me, you're going to write me. And said hello at what is it? Hello at Inside of You podcast. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. Hello at Inside of You podcast. You're going to email me. You're going to say, "Wow, Sonos really is badass." It is. It's a badass product. I've had this for years. I really encourage you to try it. Um, they're inexpensive and they do what you need. You don't have to have these bulky speakers and all this crap around your house. Just get a Sonos, and uh, it's so easy. Just go to Sonos.com to learn more. You're listening to Inside of You. With Michael Rosenbaum. I hope you're enjoying your week. I hope, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. There's so many freaking podcasts out there, but you choose this one, or maybe uh, you're, you're tuning in for the guests. But regardless, I'm glad you're tuning in, and I hope that you continue to listen and maybe subscribe after the podcast is over. We've had a lot of great guests. Uh, I think what you get here with this podcast is intimate conversations, real conversations. It's not like two actors are talking about actory shit. Mm -hmm. um, I like to get deep. And uh, I like to uh, talk about real, real things, mental health and, and all that stuff and careers and, you know, what makes people tick, facing adversity, all that stuff. So if you like the show and you hear that noise in the background, that's, uh, that's the gardener and uh, he wanted to be included in this podcast. <laughs> so uh, Ryan, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. It's always a treat. Uh, I know you've had a day. I've had a day. Yeah. We both kind of. We're, I'm just we're, a lot of it. We're kind of going through the motions today. It sort of felt like when I walked in. Yeah, just feel like <laughs> feels like you're going through the motions. And uh, but hey, man, say your gratitudes every day. That's what gets me through. Is just waking up and saying, "Hey, I'm grateful. I'm alive here today, folks. We're alive. We're doing it. We're really doing it." As my friend Tom Lally says, "We're doing <laughs> it, dude. We're really doing it." <laughs> just continue doing it, man. For me, all right. Do it and do it for you. Uh, I'd like to say before we get into this great guest, Anthony Michael Hall, um, I have a stage it, two performances coming up November 20th, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can go to sunspin.com. The name of the band is Sunspin. We have two shows, Ryan, 2 p.m., 6 p.m., virtual shows. You could watch, you could bid, tip, whatever you want, and just prizes and Zooms to be won, to be had. It's a lot of fun. My my band partner, Rob Danson, and I. In fact, Tom Lally, my old band member from Left on Laurel, is going to join us. So November 20th, get tickets. You can go to stageit.com or sunspin.com. And also, uh, briefly, I'd like to mention a charity that I'm a part of, Echoes of Hope. Um, for the next month or two, Echoes of Hope is hosting a holiday event for under-resourced children, teens, young adults, Roughly 300 students will be supported this December, and if they want to purchase a gift or two, if you, let, you guys would like to purchase a gift or two, you can visit our wish list on Amazon by going to at our Echoes of Hope, that's at O-U-R, Echoes of Hope, on social media. These are students who a lot of times do not have the family, 
So they oftentimes spend the holidays alone, and it can be a very lonely time for them. So we host a holiday party to make the holiday season special for them. Visit echoesofhope.org to learn more. Uh, there's a bunch of different options for giving on the donate page. So I'd like to uh, just a uh, little shout out to Echoes of Hope, my wonderful charity that I'm on the board for. And uh, uh, if you want to follow us, by the way, or write a review, please do so. Please subscribe. And Ryan, tell them the handles they could follow us on the Insta. They can go to at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at Inside of You Pod on Twitter. That is correcto mundo. That's it. That is right. Um, yes. I appreciate all you guys. I appreciate all my lovable patrons who uh, give to the podcast a little bit more. And it helps the podcast survive so I could pay amazing people like Ryan and Jason and Bryce. And uh, all you do is go to patreon.com slash inside of you, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash inside of you. You can give back. There's also different tiers and things that you can get and enjoy. And it's become a big family. People have become friends. There's a lot of people that have really united and become lifelong friends. And it means a lot to me. And it means a lot to me that they, uh, they donate and they give back to the show. And if you feel like doing so, feel free. Patreon.com slash inside of you. Right now, this guest is, uh, I was excited to talk to him, mm -hmm. Anthony Michael Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, name a movie, Vacation, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, Weird Science, uh, Johnny B. Good, Edward Scissorhands, and his new movie, uh, Halloween Kills, with Jamie Lee Curtis, directed by David Gordon Green. I'm very excited. Um, it's a really fun movie. It's really fun, action-packed. That's perfect for the holiday. You got to see it. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to him, and he was open. And I was nervous because I like to geek out, and I like to talk about you know the old movies and the old the old days. And what do you think? Uh, I think you restrained yourself. I think it was good. I think he was happy to talk about everything, which was cool. Yeah, yeah. He really opened up. I asked him some some good shit. I think you're going to enjoy this. And please spread the word to subscribe to the podcast. And without further ado, let's get inside of Anthony Michael Hall. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. We're talking about age right now. We just uh, we're here with Mike. We're here with Anthony Michael Hall. But you like Mike? Yeah. You go as Mike. I do, bro. Yeah, your whole life you go Mike. Yeah. Now so it's like the Bob version of whatever my three names is. Well, it just sounds so easy, right? Yeah. You don't want people going Anthony Michael Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want like it's Mike. I'm Long, just Mike. That's it. You know, Long name short story. Yep. Is this is this your <laughs> first horror film? Halloween Kills. This is. You know what I did? A, I did a zombie flick. Um, about 10 years ago with daryl hannah and and i worked with this company the asylum do sharknado and all yeah. that shit. They're great they were a lot of fun but that was just i don't even i still don't know what happened it took like two and a half weeks it was one of those you know? right, right right yeah <laughs> uh but this one dude i've never been more pumped we shot this movie two years ago in uh wilmington north carolina and everybody was fucking great um david gordon green Danny McBride. Who does mostly comedy. And Danny McBride, who I've you know I've auditioned for. Me too. And before love this. Yeah. 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 And he's a great guy. But you don't think of these guys as writing horror or directing horror. Exactly. And so, but when you watch, like all my friends and I for Halloween, I'm a big horror movie fan, if yeah. you haven't noticed by all yeah, the yeah. fucking horror movies in here. <laughs> but like we were watching all the Halloweens. And I've noticed with the exception of a couple, they're mostly shit. They're not that. Gr they're not really yeah. good movies. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, it turned with David Gordon Green's movies. That's how I felt like it. Just all of a sudden, the quality is like, well, where, where did this come from? Yeah, let's tell a story and let's. Uh, it just got, got better and better. So it's got to be fun to be a part of that, like that creative crew. Definitely. And when this came up two years ago, I'm with uh, these great guys at Untitled, Jason Weinberg and Mitch Mason. They called me, and I just initiated. I said, "Listen, I'd love to get together with David, meet with him." He came to town because those guys live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, so you South wanted Carolina. you wanted to get with him first. Yeah, you you liked this meeting. guy and you wanted to meet him totally. So before the uh, before I did the screen test, I met with the, him on uh, La Cienega somewhere, a hotel he was staying at, and he was just a great guy, man. He shows up, he's wearing like a Bob Seger t shirt, talking on you know, first name basis with the bartender, <laughs> right? And he was just super chill, and he we talked about it. We talked about his process. Uh, and how he and Danny moved back east with their you know with their families and their wives, and they just kind of regrouped. 
But also he mentioned how they set their life up. They did all these great shows on HBO that we all loved. You know, and, He's batting uh, down, man. Dude, One of my favorites. Vice Principal, all that stuff. Yep. I mean, great work. And then uh, at this point, they had, I think Halloween was out for about a year or so. So, uh, you know, that was it. And then after that, I did the screen test. I went in and just- So you, you, know. you auditioned still? I did, but I just met with David first, which was great because we had about an hour to kind of shoot the shit and just talk about process and what he wanted to do and what his objectives were and the whole thing. Great guy, man. He actually reminded me a lot of John Hughes, Mike. Really? Yeah, dude, because he's super chill, very down to earth, very easy going. And even when we got on the set, his process was great, man. He was very collaborative, truly like kept the dialogue going, got ideas from everybody. He's not uptight. So you, about you had an idea. Oh, He'd totally. say, let's try it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And also like John, it's that thing of you work with so many directors, two great ones. Um, you do two or three takes the way it's written, and then we digress. You know, if it's if it's cool, if not, you move on, you know. But he was great, man. He was really great. Jeez. Is it, have you seen yeah. the movie? Oh, yeah. It's fucking it's kick ass. I love it. Is it violent? Incredibly. Probably more than the Ooh. other eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not that I'm saying I love violence, but when it this comes is what to what we want, right? That's why we have rooms like this. <laughs> but, but by the way, when you're watching a Halloween movie, you want to see the kills. You want to see Dude. this shit, and you never see them. They're like they get, it got weaker and weaker as the series went along. So now we see a lot of deaths. And listen, people love this guy. Myers is. I mean, I thought there were about twenty of these films relative to Freddy and you know and right. Nightmare and all these things. Incredible. How do you win when the when the hero's the villain? And he just goes off, dude. It just Myers is going. I don't want to spoil anything, but he just goes right the fuck off. Dude, look what he got <laughs> me. Look what look what he brought me. He brought me a Halloween kill shirt. I got one from Ryan too. I got one for you. Do you really? Yeah, yeah. With you. Anthony on the shirt there. Oh yeah. Make these that. up. Not bad, huh? <laughs> do you play a badass in it? Okay, so here's the thing. In the in the mythology of of the series, in the 78 film. 43 years ago, Kyle Richards and Brian, I don't know the cat's last name. He, They were the two kids, Tommy and Lindsay, that, right. that Jamie Lee babysat. So there's an arc there. It's interesting. So in the original film, his his character was bullied by Lonnie Elam, one of the other kids. And uh, he's also the one who says to Jamie Lee in the original film, you can't kill the boogeyman, right? So he's kind right. of like starts that whole mythology. So what's really cool, listen, the last one was phenomenal. It was great. It made $255 million. They did a great job. So this picture takes up right where the other one left off, Mike. It picks right. up Halloween night. They've just set him on fire. And of course, he exits the fire and comes after the town. Of course. So yeah. <laughs> and so you, and the town kind of forges together. That's right. Yeah. And it's kind of a, all a fuck fest. Well, here's what's happening. Here's what's great. Yeah. So in this one, the movie opens. We shot at this really cool bar, uh, bar called The Rusty Nail right in Wilmington. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and the movie opens, it's the same night and, and all the, uh, the locals and the own neighbors have gathered together and they're kind of commiserating about having been survivors and victims and all that. Oh, and yeah. then he cuts loose. Then it comes up on the TV, local news, Myers, uh, Myers is on the loose again. And then it kicks off from there and it just kicks ass, man. It's really great. The I'm excited about great. this. Yeah, man. I want you to see it. You're going to love it, dude. Well, we have to watch. So in order we have like right now we have two Rob zombies and then we go into the David Gordon green, which I've seen the first one, but we, then we're going to watch it right through Hollywood kill. So we're going to, we're going to be watching this great by the end of next week. I'll have all of them. Oh, good. Good. So I, I urge you guys to watch it. It's Halloween for God's sakes. Yeah. It's Anthony Michael Hall. It's David Gordon Green. It's <laughs> it's it's you know, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I look at all this stuff. By the way, the test screen, when you mm. test screen for and you've test screened many times in your life. Yeah. We all have. Yeah. What is it? Is it just you and David Gordon Green and some producers? Is it what are they? What, no, you know they, what? You know how, how Blumhouse, Jason Blum's brilliant, right? So he set up his office. It's great. It's on in the mid, it's on Melrose, I think, or Olympic, all the way, almost towards downtown. Got a great office. His whole company is there. Obviously, it's a universal company, but so I went there, did the audition with the casting ladies that are set up there in office. Right. Um, and just, you know how it is, man. You just prepare, do your thing, and just lay it out there. Are you fun. still good with lines? Are I'm you getting old now. I got readers. Now I have readers. It's great. You got uh, the readers. Sure. You got, no sure. contacts. You got yeah. the readers. I got the readers. I'm, yeah. I'm weekly I'm readers. I'm with the readers on my head, Ryan. You'll see, kid. You got 20 years to get to your 50s. You're best. <laughs> you son of a bitch, You're right. It's good to be young. Huh? Yeah. Enjoy that dark hair now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Christopher Reeve over here with the dark hair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, but it was just great, bro. So I just really went all in. You know, I just have because that's the thing. Like, I don't know how you work. I want to hear about your process. For me, if it's a comedy or something dramatic or whatever, you just make the audience your. I mean, the crew your first audience. So same thing in the context of an audition, right? It's the women or the gentlemen in the in the room. Sometimes, as you know, they're great directors. They can really be helpful. 
So we just had a you know a couple of scenes that were in the film, and I just brought you know brought it, did whatever. Did I you did. have to go nuts at all? Oh yeah, totally. Like where you just lose your oh, shit. Dude, you got to see the movie. We're gonna have to do a part two. Schedule me. In for we'll a part do two. schedule a part We're two do here. Part two I, 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 I love hearing this stuff. I yeah, love yeah. hearing about what you do in an audition. And do you just <laughs> let go? Are you are you good at letting go? Yeah, man. I think it was important for this because I the thing that I loved and I realized when I got to Wilmington is that David, you know, he had this kind of hero's part for me. David and Danny gave me this great role, and Jamie Lee and Jason Blum. So Tommy is kind of like the eye of the storm, man. He kind of goes after, you know, Myers and he just, like I told you, the way the movie opens. But in fairness to all the other actors, Michael, it's a great arc that he gives us all. Everybody goes, okay, fuck this. We're going to unify. We're going to fight. We're going to go forward. And Nobody so, has an arc in Halloween movies yeah. or slasher films. No so the shit. fact that you're, you're just having meet. a little arc here, yeah, anybody yeah. has an arc is good. You're just set up to be carnage. That's C-A-R-N-A. <laughs> You know, I, I look at this, I look at your body of work, and it's it, it's crazy. I know you, you've heard it a million times, but like Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, Weird Science, Edward Scissorhands, Pirates of Silicon Valley, which as Bill Gates, you were just fucking genius. Thanks, I brother. remember seeing that going, this guy should be in everything. <laughs> Thanks, you know, uh, 61, where you play YD4, Dead Zone, the series, you worked with my friend Sean Piller. Great guy. We have a mutual friend, Sean. Yep. Great guy. You got to direct an episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've done so much. Now, is it, do you, how much do you hate talking about the past going into like the past because i mean it's it's part of your part of the present you know what michael i've always been open to it i embrace it because had i not worked with hughes as a kid i wouldn't be sitting here man so i'm always like just the opposite man i'm happy to discuss john hughes i mean the guy was a genius I love when we were kids stuff. i was a, you know he was like a big brother to me yeah you yeah, yeah well, i loved you, him man i still miss him really i do I, I, I want to get into all that stuff. Sure, but like man. your mom, your mom raised How you. How long is this? Is this three hours? Three no, it's less it's than an hour. I can't talk more go? than an hour. We're already, lunch, we're already dude. ten minutes I'm, in. I'm middle aged. I don't know how long you. Are you already hungry? Think. No, I'm good. Just you good? The coffee's not enough. <laughs> but coffee's like, good. Look up in the sky. It's the finance super app. Invest with powerful tools and unmatched automation. Borrow with some of the lowest rates, or spend your hard earned cash from their secure digital checking account, M1 Finance does it all. All with a few taps in their sleek, modern app. It's no wonder Money, Investopedia, and Yahoo Finance are raving about this app or that hundreds of thousands of investors have trusted over $5 billion in assets on the platform. They say you shouldn't always go with the flow, but this tidal wave of cash and savvy financiers might be on to something. Plus, get a $30 bonus to your M1 Invest account when you get approved and fund it with $1,000 within your first 14 days. It's so simple. Go to M, that's M as in Michael, m1finance.com slash inside of you to get started. That's M, the number one, finance.com. Investing involves risk, including the risk of loss. Borrowing on margin can add to these risks. Rates may vary. Terms and conditions apply. Inside of you is brought to you by Brooklinen. Uh, I'll tell you what, when it comes to comfort, uh, you're looking at comfort right here. Do you see how I dress? Always comfortable. My house is very comfortable. I mm -hmm. like people to be comfortable in my house. Mm -hmm. I like to be comfortable in my bed. Mm -hmm. Brooklinen is there. Brooklinen works directly with manufacturers to make luxury available directly to you without the luxury level markups. So you get their amazing array of products at a reasonable price. They're so confident in their core products that they'll come with a 365 day warranty and fans are confident too. They've received over 75,000 five-star reviews and counting. So give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it for less at Brooklinen. Go to brooklinen.com and use promo code INSIDE to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and enter promo code INSIDE for $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's brooklinen.com, promo code INSIDE. Inside of you is brought to you by my good friends at Sonos. I say good friends because I've been using Sonos products long before they were a sponsor, 18 years before they were my sponsor. I love the Sonos. I have it all throughout my house. I could play a different song in each room of the house. I could play a, Ryan, I could play some Mazzy Star just to chill in my bedroom. I could play some Duran Duran. Uh, in the living room, maybe the outside, I could have a party mode. There's so much you could do with Sonos, and it's just they're, they're beautiful, subtle pieces of, of sound equipment, if you will. Uh, 
you know, many are just the speaker itself. So all you need is a speaker to resonate throughout the room with a beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. uh, they have really designed these things amazingly. Uh, Sonos Roam is the ultra portable smart speaker. This new Roam speaker. Have you heard of this, Ryan? Uh, yes. Well, the Sonos Roam is the ultra portable smart speaker that allows you to bring the Sonos experience everywhere you go. Rome weighs less than a pound, folks, and its premium durable design makes it a perfect, perfect asset for the home and for on the go. So when you're home, Rome connects to your Wi-Fi network and the rest of your Sonos system and then automatically pairs with your phone on Bluetooth when you're on the go for a seamless experience. Using automatic true play tuning, Rome smartly adapts to your surroundings and whatever you're listening to and creates sound that's astonishingly detailed and perfectly balanced. Control Rome using the app, Apple AirPlay 2, or your voice with Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. With Sonos, you can start with one speaker and expand your system over time like I did. All Sonos speakers connect over Wi-Fi so you can group speakers in different rooms and play music, like I said, throughout your entire home. Sonos is wonderful if you haven't tried it. It's 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 the gift that keeps on giving, and it's the holidays now. And I trust me, you're going to thank me, you're going to write me. And said hello at what is it? Hello at Inside of You podcast. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. Hello at Inside of You podcast. You're going to email me. You're going to say, "Wow, Sonos really is badass." It is. It's a badass product. I've had this for years. I really encourage you to try it. Um, they're inexpensive and they do what you need. You don't have to have these bulky speakers and all this crap around your house. Just get a Sonos, and uh, it's so easy. Just go to Sonos.com to learn more. But your mom <laughs> raised you. She did. I grew up in Manhattan, New York City. My mother remarried. She was a single mom till I was about 12. And she married my stepfather, who was a great guy. Uh, he passed on a couple of years ago, my father. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. And uh, Tom Chistero, my stepfather. So he was a great guy. So, you know, I had the benefit of kind of both. I was the son of a single mom. I also had a nuclear family, that kind of thing. East Coast upbringing, New York City. My company is Manhattan Films. And, and I've been developing projects for years, um, you know, working on different things that I'm trying to set up. So I, I consider New York a great teacher, man. That's why yeah. you know, it was everything to me. It was really, because I sucked in school. How were you in school, right? Were you any good? Bs. Barely. I was Cs like, and Ds. That was me I was too. colorblind. I was slow. I was ADD. I couldn't keep my shit together. I didn't think I was going to amount to much of anything. Thank you. I My combined <laughs> score, my SAT, I think was 400. It's embarrassing. It was kind of. But it doesn't mean, did you think. It didn't think, mean shit. Did, when you grew, when you were growing up, <laughs> did you think you were dumb? Did you feel dumb? No, I didn't feel dumb. I just was very, I, I couldn't deal with school. It just bored the shit out of me. It was cool to meet girls and, and go to gym and lunch, and that was about it. I Did you get girls student. at a young age? Oh, I had some dates. Really? Yeah. Because, you know, you watch your persona as a young kid, on, <laughs> and you're like, this guy's funny. He plays a, a geek just amazingly. <laughs> He's lovable. But did you milk that? Was that kind of like you were the funny guy? Oh, I don't always... know if I milked it. I mean, I think I just had fun. I was one of these kids, like, I don't know who you were growing up, but I was doing shows for my family. I, you know what I mean? I'd, do, I'd imitate my aunts and uncles and, and play funerals and weddings. and You know what I mean? So that's how Are I you started. Are you serious? No, I swear to God. You know, never having been a, a, a stand-up. That's how I think I started my family. Definitely, man. I was imitating aunts and uncles. and That's what I was doing. Were you? Same was, thing, right? My parents would go out to dinner and they'd come home and they'd say, how was SNL? And I would go, oh, well, you know, Tommy Finnegan, uh, I would say goes- And do the sketches, or, right? Or I would do, and I would do all the sketches. Yeah. You look absolutely marvelous. marvelous. I would do that. I go, my yeah, daddy yeah, yeah. always told me, Fernando, it's better to look good than to feel good. <laughs> and I would do the church lady. Hello again. It's the church lady. This yeah. is the church chat. And yeah. I would do that and I would reenact it. And I think my parents just thought, what's wrong? I don't know what's what's going on with him. Yeah. This is the only thing he can do. No, I'm with you, man. In the 70s, I remember like you'd had to stay up late to watch SNL, man. It was like a treat, you know? So yeah. I, I grew up watching all that, that first cast. I mean, I was very young. I'm 53 now. But it meant so much That's to me young, growing by up, the way. That's young. Thanks, 53. brother. Come on. 53 yeah, yeah. is young. No, it is. It is young. I didn't say I was old. He's just jumping in. He's not sure. I cut it out. That's what yeah. it's well, okay. I'm, well, I'm, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. You're right there. No, but honestly, you know how it is. It was a very important show, you know? And and I've always loved comedians and stand-ups. I mean, my heroes growing up were Carlin, Richard Pryor. Oh, yeah. Then I studied Lenny, and you know what I mean? And I and I have nothing but love for comics, man. That's a tough life. It is. It is. But I love them. So and SNL was just a great experience. I mean, the year I was on sucked, but it was a great Great what do you mean it sucked? I saw, I was watching an old clip of when you guys were doing the armpit farts and you're, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're reviewing the book with Robert Downey Jr. And you're sitting there going, yeah, this guy was pretty much. Right. And the exactly. writing Thank was you. pretty much. 
Thank you. You he know, look at he's good at that. Yeah, and you were doing armpit farts, and he's making. And I just thought it was hilarious. That's all I, I never. That was my best shit at seventeen. That's all I could come up with. But I hear that you were. You said this in a recent interview that you were scared as shit the entire time. Oh, totally. For the reasons, because of the context I gave you before. You know, it meant so much to me. And then the Eddie Murphy years. I'm in high school watching him, and then Piscopo and and Crystal. After that, I loved all those guys, man. So after I agreed to the show and I got the you know the call from Lauren. What year was that? Eighty five. Right after I'd done Weird Science. And it was just incredible. I remember saying yes and then walking around the city like, what the fuck did I just But most people to? don't, usually Lauren <laughs> hires people when they're nobodies. Yeah. So all of a yeah. sudden you've got a couple of hit movies yes. and now they're bringing you on SNL. Isn't that odd? I had the good fortune of working for him like many of us. Obviously it's an institution now, four decades and running. He's an incredible guy. You know, he really knows his stuff. So it was a great training ground. And yeah, you're right. Usually comics or, or, or people that do Second City or right. Citizens Upright Brigade, you know, improv yep. actors. So I felt very fortunate. It wasn't lost on me even as a kid, but uh, just a great experience, man. It's fun. What even when it's like, even yeah. when you don't have a great sketch, it's great, man. It's a lot of fun. What was it like, like the days leading up when you're in rehearsal, when you're doing all these things? Are you still are you nervous every day? Well, let me tell you the schedule. First of all, we'd come in on Monday. I'm sure you've talked to people that have been. All right, I, I want to hear it. Yeah. So you come in on Monday. You start writing. You start pairing off and kind of going into people's cubicles, not unlike Thirty Rock, that environment, right? And then the show's written the next two days. Everybody works around the clock. They woodshed. They do their thing. They write sketches. Wednesday at like noon, you turn in your sketches. And you are you writing at this yeah, young age? Yeah, I was. I was. How I old was. are you? 17. 17. You're already kid. writing. Yeah. Because I realized no one gave a shit. And if I didn't, I, you know, I wouldn't probably. You wouldn't perform. Yeah. But what was really cool was Lauren fostered this environment where he would set, you know, like, go speak to Don Novello, you know, or go, go. he would pair us with these legendary great writers, man. So we wouldn't. You know, he would encourage that process and we'd have to kind of make the rounds and go right. around, you know. So anyway, back to the schedule, we shoot, we write Monday through Wednesday, you turn in the sketches and then we do a read through about three o'clock. And then what, what Lauren does is he invites the cast and crew in and he kind of sits at the head of the table, whatever gets the best laughs, he starts, you know, itemizing all the sketches. And then he goes right. back to his office, the cork board with the index cards, three half hour columns, figures it out, you know. And then Thursday through Saturday, around the clock rehearsals. It's like 12 hours a day. So people, I mean, I, I have nothing but love for everybody who's worked on the show. And so many great women and men. I mean, honestly, I think there have been even more great women on the show over the yeah. years. But so many great people, man. So that's how it goes. It's like a six-day-a-week job, man. And when you go live, when you're ready for that Saturday night live, when oh, they say it. That's the rush. Is, is, that, the, is that the rush? Is oh, that literally. The, no, it literally is like a visceral. It's a rush. How many shits do you take before a show? I take at least three. At least three shits. Shit. That's, yes. that's, that's yes. what yes. I And we do this show twice, so that's six shits per show. Six shits. <laughs> that down. Six shits. Did you have things that were cut out of rehearsal? Well, I think that's part of the the impetus for why he does it. You know, he tapes certain things. Like, they tape that whole show. We do it twice. Right. You know, so you, they bring in an audience at, at uh, what is it, 7 or 8 o'clock. We do the whole show live, soup to nuts, top to bottom. And then they kick that audience out. They bring another audience in, and then we do it again live. Amazing. So it's twice. Oh, you know, on Saturday you do it. And you worked Incredible. you had you had these guest stars come in, these these uh, the big actors. Yeah. Who was the one that you remember that you were like, oh shit, look who's gonna be on SNL? Well, you week? know what? It was all kinds of people. Was, the year I was on, it was we had, you know, Madonna, Oprah. I mean, it was just all these people. To, uh Billy Martin, the former manager for the Yanks. Wow. Uh, Marvin Hagler. This is the mid 80s. Marvelous you know? Marvin yeah. Hagler. Who was the biggest pain in the ass? Madonna uh, had to be probably me at the time. Yeah, probably. Me. How were you a pain in the ass? Well, I wasn't asked back, so let's just deduce. Were you? No, I wasn't. You were. You were a nice guy. I was a nice guy, but I wasn't asked back, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Madonna, Madonna was cool, man. Madonna was great. Was she, she was, like, "I love you, I love you"? No, none role? of that. No, no, she no, was super that. cool. She was really very sexy, very professional, very serious, focused, petite. She is short. Very petite, man. Very short, short girl. No, she was awesome, though. Honestly, everybody was good on the show. I mean, the, the hosts were, and there was that thing of like, they would cater to the host. We would kind of write for the host, and there was that emphasis, which was important. But just the fun of it, man. It's like a six day a week job. Unbelievable. Were you hard on yourself? Oh, yeah. You know, I still am. We all are in this crazy yeah. business. You know what I mean? But like we're saying, like the doing of it was great. The actual. You know everything that led up to that hour and a half. Incredible, man. And Fun. you could have you go, could you have gone more than one year, or you just wanted to be, you know you wanted to move on. To be honest, I don't think Lauren wanted me back. I mean, I I, I had <laughs> just, uh, I am being honest. Um, no, he was great. I looked up to him, but you know I don't know if he felt it was the right fit or what have you. And I was just trying to you know make my way. And I was also a wild kid. We were out you know partying throughout the week. You were a partier. <laughs> you were a party. Well, I think as a kid, I, I definitely was probably boozing it up more than I should have. 
Oh, I think I think we, we all probably did. all did. Yeah, we all did. did. Ryan, are you doing it now? Ryan? I'm doing it now. In your youth, currently. Yeah, before yeah, before again. <laughs> Ryan, you microdose before a show, or <laughs> he microdoses before every podcast we do. I do, I do six shits and six shots before every uh, every podcast. Six shits, <laughs> six shots <laughs> nice. for the show. Very nice. Now, before all this happened, like if we go way back, I mean, you were like the honeycomb kid. You oh were doing gosh. commercials. I mean, seriously, yeah, you were yeah. you were doing like. Were your, was your mother surprised because she was a singer? By the way, do you sing? I do make music. I haven't in years, but I love to make music. I play a little guitar and bass and, you know. Why don't you ever record something? I did years ago, and I'm actually working with a guy. I have a business partner named Jason Maris, a great guy, and we are working on stuff. We actually just produced a song we sold to uh, Machine Gun Kelly, actually. So Get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm working on music still. And you yeah. sing? You're singing in the yeah, song? Yeah, I mean, right now, well, yeah, I am. Yeah, but right now, we're just kind of tracking stuff, and he's really good. He's This guy's had like 35 top 100 oh, hits. Yeah, he's written for dude. The Weeknd, a lot of people. He's great. So that's fun. I still like doing it, you know? Yeah, of course, man. I think I always wanted to be a rock star. And I was always like, yeah, you don't have the voice. You don't have the musicianship. And then one day I said, fuck it. Why am I so worried about everybody else? You know, why don't I just do it? Yeah. And yeah, it yeah. has been the best, most amazing experience to just make a CD. Great. Make a CD. Make an album. <laughs> make a tape. <laughs> he thinks it's the 90s, right? He's talking about CDs. Know, for sure. Did he get rest last night? What's going on with Rosenbaum? <laughs> a CD. But, I made an eight track and I brought it to you. <laughs> but like you, you're doing all this stuff. What was, you know, and your mom's singing and she's taking care of the family pretty much. She's supporting you. She was until she met my, my father, you know, my stepfather when I was about 12 and they had my sister. My sister's an incredible artist. Uh, she goes by Mary C and the Stellar. She has a great band in New York city. She's incredible. She's a mother now, but she's an incredible artist. She went the route of making music. You check her out on YouTube. My sister. Yeah. yeah she's produced about five or six albums. So I'm going to blow up my sister. Yeah. But so I think it was just that thing, Michael, of like growing up in the city, man. That was why I was a great teacher. I saw everything was possible. You're, you're around so many different things, so much culture. Um, just the city, what it represents, man. It was like incredible growing up in New York. Did you have this innate confidence? Do you think you had at a young age that you were like, you look back and go, God, I wish I had that confidence. Because I, I do. I feel like I, I wish I had the confidence I did when I was younger. I just right. didn't take no for an answer. I didn't give a shit. That's it. And, yeah. But I think yeah. when you grow up, you start to give a shit more. No, that's a great point. I had the similar perspective on it as a kid. Yeah. You kind of just fearless and then you learn the craft and it beats you up to business and you just have to, then I think you get your, you, you create or you get to those critical, you know, places where it's like, do I really want to do this? And you have to really decide to reinvest and keep going. But absolutely, man, you have to have a thick skin. You got to be determined. You got to be kind of crazy. Right. And those were in that regard, you, do, you, you know, and I had that same mount, you know, mindset that you did. So you just, you, you didn't care or you cared, but you just said, I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. And I think, like you said, as we get older, you become more self-conscious in some ways, maybe and that's all whatever, but then you kind of unlearn that stuff. Just depends on the work. So I just, I, I've always just looked at it like, you know what? No one's going to take this from me. I'm going to keep working and just keep developing over time, you know, and mixing yeah. it up. Cause you know how it is. We don't have the luxury of picking projects necessarily. It's not what people think, you know, it's yeah. a lot of year round hustle. Was your mom yeah. always really proud of you? Do you remember like her yeah, being you know, always yeah. like, you know, saying, hey, I'm really proud of you doing great. Oh, no, Did totally. you get that kind yeah. of thing at home? Oh, definitely. No, I had great support from my mother, my father, and my sister, you know, and I think that kind of Northeast upbringing really served me well, you know. And you're always funny at home yeah. too. You're always I kind was. of it was always, jokes. Yeah, always. <laughs> yeah, just to get out of shit or make up for bad grades or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I was a goofy kid, man. I was always- And popular? Around. Were you popular in no, school? No, no. I mean, well, don't forget, like when I was in high school, I went to work. So I, there was no real, you know, I went to high school until about ninth grade and then I was busy with Hughes, you know? What was the first one? So I never got? experienced like popular in high school. I don't know what that was. You don't know what popular was. <laughs> no. I don't know, but you, you're talking to someone who doesn't know what popular is either. <laughs> never, never was popular. Shortest kid in my high school. Were you? Didn't start puberty till I think my junior year, I got some hair on my balls. I used to pray at night <laughs> to God, please give me hair on my balls or under my armpits. Very nice. For, I didn't get that. Does that make you uncomfortable? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Okay, good. I okay. had hair on my balls by uh, about 18, 19? No, <laughs> 12, 13. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first first big role, the first thing you did? Well, you know what? Thinking back, talking about my early childhood as a kid in New York, I auditioned, this is how old I am, On Golden Pond. You auditioned for On Golden Pond? So what was this movie? Like 1970? Yeah, 80, 78. So, right. So that, I was about eight years old. I'm, I'm in this game 45 years, man. Wow. So, yeah. And I remember not getting the part, and I had a great exchange with Mark Rydell, who was so cool, even to me as a little kid. Because I remember him breaking the news to me, basically saying, no, it's not going to work out. And they hired Doug McKean, who was the kid in the film. 
So that's how far I go back, you know. And then I did commercials and it was just kind of like a hobby that spun, you know, into some work. So the first big one to your question was like vacation, Chevy Chase and, and what Lampo. was what was that audition like? Do you remember auditioning for that? I remember walking in and meeting Matty Simmons. He was a great guy. Uh, we lost him a couple of years ago. He created Lampoon magazine. And I remember meeting Harold Ramis and Matty on that day. You went, went in for the first audition yeah, for all for those vacation. guys. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your audition? Do you remember what scene I, I don't you were reading? No, I don't remember what scene, but it was something probably with Chevy, one of the scenes. Maybe the Chevy scene was did. there? No, no, no. But it was probably the scene in the desert with Chevy. You know, it was probably one of those scenes. I don't I don't recall. Were you drinking the beer? Yeah, it was probably one of but those. But you didn't have yeah. you didn't meet Chevy before you got the part. No, no, just Maddie and Harold Remus. So that was a big that that was really cool. What's interesting too is John Hughes actually wrote that screenplay. I didn't meet right. him then, right? So his trajectory was interesting. He started selling short stories to Lampoon Magazine. Right. He had been a copywriter in Chicago. He wrote, and that's what she's having a baby is that context. So Kevin Bacon's playing him. Elizabeth McGovern was playing his right. wife. And uh, so he sold this short story. Next thing you know, they made it into the film. I did that film, didn't know John. And then right after that, I did 16 Candles and audition for him and then, right. uh, as a kid and then did three in a row with him. Yeah. But Vacation Man. That that is, I always think of like people when they work with Chevy Chase because you always hear things. You hear things. I've had uh, Joel McHale. He was on here and he talked Joel's about it. He, he, yeah. he loves Chevy, but like you know, there was some problems on set. Was there? Like, yeah. yeah, on the community yeah. and mm. things happen, and you know, he got fired and all these all these mm. things. Do you remember him being very giving and and, and nurturing and kind of like guiding you because you had to be nervous as shit, or were you not? Oh, I was nervous. Yeah, as a kid, absolutely. By the time I did Community, no, I had a different take on it. But I had a great time on that show. I mean, there were so many great actors on that show. All, all the whole cast was cool. And, um, I, you know, I worked with him briefly on that. Yeah, I but mean, vacation, vacation though. I'm talking about vacation. No, on vacation. I mean, I was just, I was rusty. I was 14 years old, so I, I looked up to everybody, man. You know, John, John Candy was great. John Candy really was a big personality and a lot of fun. What was it about him? Well, Chevy was kind of like the way he is, kind of snarky and funny, you know what I mean? But Candy was Uncle Buck, man. He was really, and the way it happened was we shot one ending, it didn't work. And it was that thing where the studio tested it, they got the cards back and they realized from the original ending that they never made it to Wally World. So we regrouped six months later, puberty kicked in. I'm like four inches taller. I get to the set at Magic Mountain. I got a huge zit on my chin. Chevy's like, nice. Okay, you're jerking off. Good to see you've grown. Uh, it was he just- probably like, did But say that's that. how Chevy was. Yeah, yeah. No, he said, uh, yeah, something like that. If you're blind, you're doing it right, meaning I was whacking off. I don't know what the hell he was saying. Um, and then they hired John Candy, and that's the ending we shot that they used. So the test screening came back and the audience was like, shit, we want to see them make it to Wally World. They never did. So that's how it happened. Then we reshot the ending and we did it. Did you think the movie was going to be? I mean, you hear this you, all the time. You have no idea. You never know. I think anybody who says that they knew when they were making something, I, I think that that's a, I think that's BS. You never really know. I mean, I had a great time and I was working with all these legends, you know. But as a kid, I wasn't processing the future success of it or anything. Were like you that. on to the next thing while you're already finishing? Well, that? 16 Candles. So then back in New York, I'm like in ninth grade. I get the audition for 16 Candles. I go and meet John and Jackie Birch, the casting director, who uh, who really you know put me on, as they say. And I did those three films. I got 16 Candles after about 10 auditions. Wait, 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 wait. 10 auditions. I no, honestly, at that time I remember doing that many. There was a bunch, and. You know how that thing of like when they're trying to pair people off, if they're close to hiring you, they'll bring you back in and they'll kind of mix and match you with yes. the actors. Right? So that was that kind of thing. So that was cool. And then I got that. And then right after that, we did the other two consecutively. And did you test screen with Molly? Or wait, wait. For no, no, no. It was no screen testing on that film. It was just rounds of auditions and they would have executives in. And I, and I was kind of honored because every time I came back in the room, there'd be like three more executives from Universal. <laughs> it was like by the last auditions, there was like eight people in the room. So Who were some of the other kids who were, were up for that part? I don't recall. I, you know what's so funny? In the interim, I've read that Jim Carrey did, uh, and I don't remember meeting him. I love Jim Carrey, but I never, I don't remember meeting him. But I think he was up. That's how old we are. It's great. Jesus. Now, Jim Carrey's a lot older than you. He is, but I think he, I think I read something that he'd auditioned for, which is pretty funny. Was that, if you I love Jim Carrey. Yeah. I love Jim Carrey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim Carrey. Fucking great. By the way, you do impressions, don't you? Not really. Because no. I, I read somewhere that you always would do yeah. impressions. You, when you were on SNL, mm, you did impressions. I can't remember if we did anybody. We did a sketch where, I think we did the Kennedys, and I think that was kind of funny. You played John F. Kennedy? I played Robert, I think. Uh, who played JFK? I forget who played JFK, but I think Randy Quaid played Lyndon Johnson. Madonna was playing Marilyn. <laughs> and then Downey, I forget who Downey was playing, but yeah, and the Kennedys, yeah. 
I think I did one of them. Ask not what your country. I don't know what I thought. I was that was, I, I can yeah. hear that's that right there. Well, that's the Boston. The Boston. Because you're from Boston. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, I don't, I'm not like, you know, Rich Little. I saw Rich Little recently, by the way. You, you, wait, he's still alive? He's still alive. I just saw him in Rich Vegas. Little. Was he Rich funny? Little, he was great. He was great. How old is Rich Little? He's 114. Is he 114 yeah, he's now? He's doing well, though. He asked about you. <laughs> he asked about me. 16 Candles, obviously was that that's the movie that really took took things off for you i mean that was it the, did man it did you know because so i can't was, imagine what it's like to be 15 16 years old and you're just become a star i mean how do you keep your I head couldn't on either. straight i couldn't either man it was a trip it was it's like it, everything you do at that point yeah so i read somewhere like you were the fourth most uh they said the fourth best teen actor of all time you were ranked on this list of 200 no teen actors wow. and they said you were number four i don't know how you weren't number one what was that like a vh1 contest what was that? i don't know what it was wow but i'm telling you it's seems like everything it. you touch turned to gold it was mostly hughes honest to god michael he was great you know he had these parties set up the scripts were great there were always a nice sort of equal distribution of fun stuff for us to do and just the way he worked man he gave us all those great opportunities and like i said he was very cool with like collaborating trying stuff he was always kind of conspiring with the actors to make it funnier and uh you know in a similar way david gordon green same thing man very natural talented writer great director um, not sticklers not sticklers great perfect word you know really open to the process and fluid and let things happen which is cool and i think when when directors are like that as you know you're gonna you're gonna go that much further for the director man you're gonna do you know yeah give it your all so that's the environment that he created michael that's why it was great have you had experiences where you you're, you don't get that freedom man where you just like no say it by the well book. you know how it is yeah without naming names you know you do movies or even tv shows man and you don't necessarily always get that vibe from directors and i've worked with a lot of great directors and some okay you know some great tv directors you know um and you know you're always learning but some of them are more you know subdued than others or they might work right. from the monitor you know how it is just get a, a variance of different things with different people Inside of you is brought to you by Geico, folks. Ryan, do you uh, own or rent your own home? I rent my home. Do you uh, well, own or rent your home? I own my own home. Wow. And uh, it could be a lot of work. It's yep. a lot of work for both of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you're renting a home or owning a home, it's 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 the toughest part. It's the toughest bills to pay. Mm -hmm. It's a pain in the arse. Mm. But you know what's easy, Ryan? Bundling with Geico. You're damn right. Bundling policies with Geico. Geico, folks, makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your house or your apartment, and you just want to be able to pay all this in one fell swoop. You know what I mean? It's just make it easy on yourselves. Make it easy. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico. Dot com. Inside of you is brought to you by Helix Sleep. How many people out there don't sleep well? How many people out there understand that sleep is the most important thing you can do in your life? It truly is. You sleep most of your life. So if you're not comfortable, if you're not getting a good night's sleep, I don't know what the hell to tell you. Helix Sleep is the shizzle nizzle. <laughs> Okay, that's the word I'm going to use right now, Ryan. The shizzle nizzle. Let's Talk about it. comfort. I have back problems. I have neck problems. With Helix, I am comfortable. I feel like I have a good night's sleep. It helps me. There are a few mattresses out, out uh, mattresses out there that help me, and I just uh, I really like what Helix is doing. And why don't you tell them what they could do and what they have to do to get a Helix Sleep mattress. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete. Two and, minutes. And it matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. So why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique, Ryan. You, me. And Helix knows that, so they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have the soft, the medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, and even a Helix Plus mattress for plus-size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz. I'm a medium guy. You know, it's like porridge, you know? Yeah. Just right. right. That's what's right for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it's been awesome getting messages from you folks uh, who also found out the Helix Matrix mattress of your dreams. My good buddy Jeff, I'll, I'll just say Jeff D, emailed me and said, hey, what's that code for uh, for Helix Mattress? And I just sent it to him yesterday. Swear to God, and he just bought a Helix Mattress, and I'm pumped that even my friends are buying them because they believe me when I talk about it. They know that, <laughs> that with all my back problems, I, I, I don't BS. So look, if you're looking for a mattress, just take a quiz. It's a quick quiz. Even I could pass it. 
Uh, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to the mattress store ever again. Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word for it. It was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 and by GQ and Wired Magazine. And here's all you have to do. Just go to Helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash inside. Take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And they have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash inside. That's helixsleep.com slash inside for up to $200 off and two free pillars. That's pillows in my term. Inside of You is brought to you by BetterHelp. What would we do without better help, Ryan? Are you still doing the better help? Still doing the better help. And is it helping? It is helping. I love it. I love it. I think, you know, we're in such a climate, and I think the climate's always been there. There's always been stressful times for people. There's always, it's not like life gets any easier. It's just like, how do we make life easier? And that's better help. Better help. The folks at better help can really help you, whether you're struggling with grief, relationships, or stress or you're having trouble sleeping or meeting goals, online therapy might be for you. It's for me, it's for Ryan, it's for millions and millions of people around the world. It helps you live a better life. BetterHelp is secure online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with licensed professional therapists. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own accredited therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. Uh, the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. How easy is that? You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. I'll tell you, you know, therapists in Los Angeles can cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars and better help is just a great option visit betterhelp.com slash inside and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional in fact so many people have been using better help that they're recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states um I just love BetterHelp. i they've been a sponsor for a long time and they're helping a lot of people and i want to thank better help Inside of You is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Try BetterHelp. Many of my friends have texted me and said, does this really work? And they seem to have figured out that it does. So check out BetterHelp and get that discount. Betterhelp.com slash inside. Well, they say, like I've read, you could, you, I'm sure you've heard this story a million times, mm -hmm. but that John was really upset when you didn't take Ferris Bueller and you didn't take, uh, yeah. what's the other one? Pre, uh, Pretty, Pretty in Pink. Pink. Yeah. And he was really upset and you, you, the friendship was sort of severed for a while. Is that true? You know what happened, Mike? When I was promoting Hollywood Kills, uh, Halloween Kills in New York a couple weeks back, I had a nice conversation with a guy at a magazine and then this, this headline hit. And I'll tell you what happened. For years, I kind of opted not to tell the story, but the truth is I, he did write those two projects for me. He wanted me to do them. At the time, he was going to have Howie Deutsch, who's a great guy. I know Howie. Um, I worked with his wife, Leah Thompson. He was going to direct Pretty in Pink, and he wanted me to star in Ferris Bueller, and I was actually booked and busy on some other projects, so it just didn't work out. And I think that kind of broke John Hughes's heart. It broke mine, too, because I really wanted to continue that relationship. Yeah. So that's how it happened, man. You know. And then years later, the last time I talked to him... Um, he called me with John Candy on the phone. It was incredible, man. And we hung out like this for a couple hours and just wow. shoot, you know shot the shit. And he talked about the potential for like a Breakfast Club sequel, and all these things were in his eyes, you know, in his in his thinking at that time. Um, but he was just the greatest man. I love him. We were always laughing. He'd take us to blues bars. We'd go to record stores. You know, we'd go and hang out at his house. I mean, what he did for me, he did for so many, you know, so many. So it's not like just, you know, me. right, right. You know the deal. There's so many great actors and actresses, and he was just putting us on the map and giving us opportunity, man. You did know? he throw shit at you like, hey, Mike, try, try, try this. A add this line right here. Oh, totally. Do this. Oh, no, try, totally. Do your own take, but be just go off on this. Yeah. No, no, no. We would talk it out between takes. I would run to the sidelines and get, you know, his input. And 
Oh, no, dude, we were always doing that, man. What's a scene that you remember or scenes that just elevated so that you were like, when the, you first started f filming it, it was like, okay, this is kind of funny. Yeah. But it just became something way funnier. Okay, perfect example. This is the true story. I'm guessing the car scene in 16 Well, let's go Candles. back to say, well, there's one of them. I got one for that too. So watch this. We're shooting 16 Candles. I'm 15 years old. I look 12, like a bobblehead. And- <laughs> I remember we're casting, we're in Chicago, and we're doing the casting rounds for the guys who are going to play my buddy, my my two buddies. So Hughes turns to me, I swear to you, I'm 15 years old. He goes, well, they're your buddies. You got, I'm going to let you cast them. I was like, what? What? So I cast Cusack. I don't even know if Cusack knows this. Call me, John. You cast uh, John. I swear to you, because John Hughes said so. I was like, I can't believe, I couldn't believe it either. And then this other guy, Darren, who played the other sidekick, who was hilarious. So back to the scene work. I mean, that scene at the high school dance, for example, just coming up with shit, like smacking them in the face, you know. You shit. turning around when you're all, like- All of that shit, all of that all shit. All that shit's all you. Yeah, well, no, because he cut me loose, because he we would come up, we would talk about it, and then he would go, go surprise him and do that this time, you know, or goofy shit. Like we do the party scene <laughs> later, after the after the party, the house party. And we go on set for blocking, and it's the scene after, uh, with Michael Schofling, right after the party's over, right? In the kitchen. Well, there's that one too, but watch. We go to the living room. Oh, yeah, yeah, And he yeah. sees, and he's, there's like a clear coffee table there. So John goes, do you think you could fit on the table? I go, watch this, boss. And I go under the table, and that became the thing under the table. <laughs> right. The thing <laughs> the thing in the kitchen is another one. We get to the set, and we're shooting in the kitchen. It's like 2 a.m. It's one of these, you got to be funny at like 2 a.m., right? So we get there. There's an apron, some peanuts. He goes, why don't you throw the apron? I go, great. Then I'm eating peanuts. And then he even set the scene. He goes, I'm going to get Sinatra's Strangers in the Night. We're going to set this all up. I mean, dude, it was like that. So perfect example. We would just wing it. We would just come up with shit and make ourselves laugh. And that was the other thing too, man. He was always truly going for the laugh. And if something came up, he he was always laughing. Like in my mind's eye, when I think about both of them, both Hughes and Harold Ramis, the, the joy, the happiness they worked with, man. They were fun. They were it's always just such laughing. such a rare thing, you know? right? When it guys is, man. get it, and then yeah. they get the comedy. And not only that, but they get you. Right. They get yeah. you and they want you to be your best and they go, well, we've got a gold mine here. We can get anything. Because you really, at that time, and you're like, you, you, it seems like you could do anything. You could make, sure. were you making the whole cast laugh constantly? It was, well, there was that. That was fun too. It really was. The idea of having fun at work and making him Who laugh. Who was the easier, easiest to laugh, make laugh? Who'd you get to laugh the most? I, well, honestly, I only remember thinking about making him laugh, but I remember that feeling of like, again, back to making the crew your audience, you have fun with it, man. But I remember wanting to make him laugh all the time because we were always working at this level where it was just like partly improv, you know? But we would always shoot it as per first. You know what I mean? So when you're under that table in 16 Candles, yeah. <laughs> that, what did you say? Did you say it was, it was a Jake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jake. Yeah, yeah. Jake. And the, yeah, and the voice cracking, man, yeah. that was all real that shit. That was all yeah, just, yeah, yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. written. No, no. Uh. Just little shit. And you, know? you go home feeling so great. Like, oh my God, I made everybody laugh today. I'm having so much fun today. Exactly. And then you grow exactly. up and you start to do roles where it's like, it's not as fun. That it's happened just too. not as fun. That happened too, to be very honest. Absolutely. But by, by the way. So it made me appreciate yeah. how great he was because all these years later, no one was like him. And in exactly. fairness, I, in fairness, I would say Ramus too. Harold Ramus was just brilliant. He was such a great guy. Yeah. So I can, I can see that when I think back, I can just see them smiling and laughing because that's how they worked, man. They were great. Was on, I don't want to talk too much about this, but like in Breakfast Club, uh, Paul Gleason. Oh, he was great. The, the late, great yeah. Paul Gleason. Was he honestly great or did he want to pers personify that dick, arrogant guy that so he tried to stay away from you? Tell me something. Let me tell you how this happened. All okay. Right. So at the time, Trading Places was in the theaters. Oh, Huge Eddie Murphy man. fan. Still am. Oh, I love yeah. Eddie Murphy. He was interviewing and auditioning the guy that played coach on Cheers. Remember the actor? The oh, I guy? loved him. He was awesome. Hilarious. So then I go see Trading Places. I come to the set the next day. I go, Johnny, go see this movie. There's a scene in Trading Places. You remember this? When Paul Gleason is at a phone booth and like a 95-year-old woman comes up to him and she's what? Remember phone booth, right? <laughs> she she comes up to him. She goes, and like she's waiting for the thing. And he puts the phone down and goes, fuck off to the old lady. <laughs> So, dude, I came back to the <laughs> set. Fuck off. I came back to the set and I told John about that. He wound up seeing the film and he brought Paul in. So it was because I'd seen Trading Places and then he we just both agreed. So you cast Paul Gleason. No, no, I didn't cast Gleason, but I, I gave but him the- You I, gave I, him the little- I did, I did. I threw that at him. And then we became friends, man. We became buddies. You know, I met Tyson through Paul Gleason, went to fights and hung out. Paul Gleason was great, man. He had two heroes, Mickey Mantle and Dylan. Wow. So, yeah, so Paul Gleason and I were buddies. I mean, so many great friends I met, bro, like yourself over the years. Bill Paxson, the late great Bill Paxson. But what about Tyson? You became friends with Tyson? I became friends with Tyson. At how old? 
18, we went to the fight at the garden. I meet Tyson. He's like just about to become champion. And uh, it, this was funny, man. He knocks this guy out in like four seconds. Wait, was that round. Spinks? No, no, it wasn't Spinks. It was way before that. I forget the guy's name. It was a garden fight. Again, about a year before he became champion. So Tyson's about 19. Knocks this guy out. And then he knew uh, Gleason. So I see Tyson come out of the ring. And me and Gleason are sitting there ringside. And he waves me over. And he goes, I'm a great admirer of your work. And I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that night I hung out with, with Tyson and Gleason. Oh, and uh, God. we became friends. I love, I just want a second about Tyson. I love this. I love I, these stories. This, this good is, stuff? This is, great. this is great. So Tyson, I got to say, I just love seeing where he's at now, right? I mean, he's got cannabis business and he's promoting concerts. I'm just happy for and him. And he's man. really he's got a bunch of kids, a great honest. wife. He is, man. He just really he tells is. it how it is. He just like, this is what I believe and this yeah. is what I'm going to say. Yeah. And it's, it, it is. It's amazing. It really is. So I'm really happy for it. I haven't seen Mike in years, but... Um, so yeah, I mean these great stories. Were well, there anybody on the Breakfast Club that you really did? I mean, you, they didn't love working with, or were there, oh, no, was no, everybody no, no, just no. great? Oh no, we all got along. It was cool. But what was funny at the time was me and Molly were kids, man. We were sixteen, so we had like homework. We had to go back to the hotel, <laughs> the Skokie Hilton or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> and then Judd and Amelia would go out and hang out. They'd go have beers and whatever because they were like you know I don't know thirty five when they did the film. No, no, they were in their early twenties. So <laughs> Molly and I had homework and Judd and, Al and Amelia hung out, but we loved each other, man. We all got along great. I looked up to all of them to this day. I love Do you Allie. still talk to them ever? I haven't spoken. I ran into Judd a couple of years ago. He's great. He's got a great sense of humor, man. Judd's funny. Amelia, I haven't seen that much. Um, Allie, I've seen over the years. The last time we were all reunited is when Mr. Hughes passed, 2010, man. We had the Oscar thing where they paid tribute to right, him. Right, right. So I thought that was very classy of the Oscars to do that. Because as you know, they don't often... You know, acknowledge comedies as it were. So, right. Yeah. But Molly, you still, every once in a while, or it's been a while since you talked to her. Yeah, so. no, it's been a couple of years since I've spoken to her, but she's cool. Very happily married. She's got a bunch of kids. She's doing great. You know, uh, the janitor. Um, oh, Kapalos. Kapalos, yeah. brother John Kapalos, a great he, guy. He was, I did this show a couple of years back and he was a guest star and we hit yeah. it off. Yeah. And he came over and karaoke with his girlfriend. Oh, great. He came to the house and karaoke. What so, a funny guy. He is. He is. So watch this. I produced a film this summer with a, a writer director named Nick Solozzi, and it's not a remake, but it's an updated kind of reimagining of The Breakfast Club. Anyway, we got, we got Kapalos yeah. in. Oh, wow. So Capolo showed up. He's a great guy. So, uh, and a great comedic actor. He's a great. Yeah. Now, how do you go from John Hughes to Tim Burton? Now, Tim Burton seems like it's got to be, he's, I'm sure he's a great guy. He is. But it's yeah. got to be a different way of working. Well, at the time when that came up, this is Edward like, Scissorhands. Yeah, 1989, man. Uh, so I went to go meet with him. And Tim, you remember the remember the cure? He looked like a lost member of the cure, right? He had the hair and <laughs> yes, yeah. And I remember when I went to his Robert office. Robert Smith. Yeah, yeah, Robert Smith. He had the leg up in the chair and he was kind of twirling his hair and shit. And really interesting guy. Very shy, actually. And very unassuming and very cool. And but he really comes to life when he directs. So he hired me for scissor hands. I auditioned for him in a room and and that was a great experience too, man. Um okay, I have a theory about Tim Burton. I think he is Edward Scissorhands. And here's why. <laughs> here's why. I'll explain. Please do. Okay, I'll explain. He grew up in, uh, in Burbank. He was a student of animation. His favorite actor was Vincent Price, right? Uh. And just, I, I, I look at him like a modern day Disney and beyond. I mean, you look at his films, they're works of art, man. Yeah. And he's one of those, fun, you know, like rare auteurs, great directors where he really has a look and feel of his movies. And they get... In, more and more brilliant since then, right? I mean, he yeah. went on to do another seven movies or whatever with Johnny Depp, right? Yeah. So I just loved Tim Burton, man. And I think at the time he felt, I think he probably thought it was kind of funny because I had sprouted up and it was a bigger guy. And then yeah, all of yeah. Sudden, you know, and Johnny was like, you know, uh, you know, to play that bully, I think he kind of thought it was a fun idea at the time. So great experience. We shot in Tampa, Florida. At the time, Johnny was with Winona and they were in right. love and all that. Um, Did you meet Vincent Price? I didn't get to work with Vincent Price. No. Uh, I, I but know all those great actresses, a... Kathy Bates, all these all these women that were in the film were fantastic, and uh, that was another great experience. I had fun on that one. And another uh, other roles I hear that you turned down. Like, did you ever meet with Stanley Kubrick on Full Metal Jacket? I did, man. You I met did. with Stanley? No, Kubrick. I didn't meet with him, but I had a couple calls with him. It's an interesting story. So, I'm doing Weird Science, and I get a call from my agent, a gentleman named Marty Bauer. It's a great guy. Uh, Marty started the Bauer Benedict Agency, which became another big agency. I think UTA, right? So as a kid, he represented me. He was like family. I love Marty. So he calls me like on a Wednesday. He says, Stanley Kubrick is interested in you in this uh, for a role in this Vietnam biopic he's doing. 
And I was like, holy shit. Because even at 17, I'd seen The Shining and all these great movies. Oh, yeah. So I get a call Friday, two days later. He goes, well, he's actually wants you for the lead, and he wants to call you tomorrow. Mic drop, right? I'm like, holy shit. What? Stanley Kubrick's trying to call me. It's like, wait for The Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> so the next morning, the phone rings. And I'm like up at pace. I'm at the Sheridan premiere up by the oh Universal City. And I'm up like pacing. Like, I'm just like, I can't believe I'm going to talk to How this old dude. are you? I'm 18. Uh, the phone rings. Michael, Stanley Kubrick. I was like, dude. I was like, <laughs> oh and then boy. this is what he said to me. He paid me the greatest compliment I've ever had. He goes like, I just finished uh, screening 16 Candles. I watched it three times. I, I couldn't believe it. I was just sitting here. <laughs> and he goes, I, I, you know, you're my favorite actor since I saw Jack and Easy Rider. I was like, dude. I'm a kid. Yeah, no, exactly. He said this that to me. So that it was amazing. It was astonishing, Michael. It was. And then even more, you know, beyond that wonderful compliment, he wound up talking about his favorite filmmakers. He started talking about Eisenstein, the great Russian director, and Chaplin. And, and dude, I'm like, and you're just sitting there listening. I, I'm standing there in the in the Sheridan premiere, like looking over the valley, like in my window, and I was just bugging out. It was incredible. So what happened was it became literally like an eight or nine month negotiation. And holy I mean, shit yeah and it was you know it was i could say in hindsight it was about money but it wasn't it was just a crazy drawn out thing he was incredibly private i had to go to his attorney's house in beverly hills and read a numbered script i mean literally dude it was like this wow and you know for whatever reason it didn't work out and 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 that's another great film of his so i mean i wouldn't have any regrets in my life i don't but in terms of a creative thing, that's probably the closest thing that it just it breaks my heart sometimes that it didn't work out. I didn't get to work with him. But right. Uh, Do you think maybe agents incredible. got in the way? No, no, no. It, no, it wasn't even like that. It was just, we just kind of parted ways, but I couldn't believe it took that long. At one point- Nine months. No, no, no. I swear to you. At, at one point, he called his lawyer and his lawyer called my father, who was a, a great manager. He discovered like Azamo and Sandra Bullock and all these people. He was a great manager, Tom. And the question that Louis Blau had for my father was, Mr. Kubrick wants to know if Tom has read Nuclear Negotiations, a book called Nuclear. Kubrick was deep, dude. Everything was chess. Jesus. Everything was chess. Nuclear Negotiations. I swear to you. I swear to you. So, so anyway, I mean, I, I would have loved to have done that. And then it's funny, little epilogue. I, I run into Matthew Modine a couple of years later in New York City, and I'm still a kid, and, you know, and he, was, he was kind of big league in me. He was funny. <laughs> I go, how you doing, Modini? Oh, cool. And then I start walking alongside him in New York, and we're talking. I go, so how, how long did you guys wind up shooting that film? You know? Tell me, Vision <laughs> Quest. I want to know. <laughs> and uh, he goes, I swear to you, he goes, 54 weeks. <laughs> 54 weeks. He Over shot a for year. a year and two weeks. Man. Wow. So, but he was just brilliant, and he had that capacity and and that allowance within our industry i mean very few people how long can shoot a film that long i think not since chaplin you know because right. chaplin was notorious that in that day of the max senate days he would shoot something and if he ran out of ideas he would just break camp you know right and chaplin would notify you when he had some ideas for stunts you know but stanley kubrick what can i say man i just bowed out i love stanley kubrick well, so I, you, I i look i'm grateful for that whole experience what was your next project while you were you were filming while that was taking place johnny be good nice choice huh no, I, I actually Johnny enjoy Johnny Be Good. Piece of shit. Did you not like that movie? No, no, I had a good time on it. I'm just joking. Downey refers to it as Johnny B movie. <laughs> Is that what he says? Yeah, it but no, it's got to be a great time. I had a good time. But on it's it. got to be hard. Like you know, it's like and you've talked about this a million times. But like transitioning. It, it's, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you transition from the biggest movie star as a teenager and then as an adult? I mean, how how often? And well, by that's the way, the thing. you yeah. did it. Yeah, no, that was the thing, you know, and the truth is, you know how it is, man. You have up and down periods. You got to be in it for the long haul, you know. Uh, Downey Senior, <laughs> Downey Senior used to joke with me as a pun on my name, Robert's father. He goes, in the long haul, the short one won't make it. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, I had no idea, man, about a career. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just a kid. But these were the experiences I had, so. Yeah. Incredible, man. By yeah. the way, I, 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 one thing I got to say is like, how old are you when you did Weird Science? 17? Mm-hmm. How do you not hit on Kelly LeBrock? Oh, she was amazing. Beautiful woman. We're still friends to this day. She's a really? lot of fun. She's a lot of fun. I mean, that had to be an amazing experience working with her. She was cool. Because every kid, because I'm your cool. age pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm watching going, holy shit. Well, here's what happened. At the time, there was another person hired, a lady named Kelly Emberg, who was also a beautiful supermodel. And unfortunately, it just wasn't working out. We shot for a couple days, and then, and then that didn't work out. Um, so then they brought Kelly and she had done Woman in Red and Kelly replaced Kelly, you know. 
Um, and she was great, man. As the British say, she takes the piss out of everybody. She's great. She's super cool. And you were improvising in that movie. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, that yeah. whole scene where you're like, call her on the telephone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was another one. Where we didn't, yeah. And John set that up. And then that kind of stemmed from being a huge fan of Pryor. I would imitate Pryor for Hughes. I would listen. Like, we would go to his house and I'd hang out with his wife and his kids. And I'm like a teenager. And we would watch everything from Advin Costello to the, you know, Laurel and Hardy to <laughs> Live on Sunset Strip or whatever. Right, right. So it kind of stemmed from, that would be like an inside joke with me and Hughes. I would imitate this character that Pryor did called Mudbone. And Mudbone was- How like, did he sound? Go outside and get some sunshine on your face, boy. You know, it was just like this old, <laughs> this old character. <laughs> and that's kind of who you modeled that character totally. off of. Totally, the great Richard Pryor. So that would make the, I just would have fun. You called it on the telephone? On the telephone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I would just goof and- it was that just is a, one of the funniest scenes ever. Thank you, bro. Film. It was just a love of Pryor, honestly. Just imitating really? Pryor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just said, keep going with it. Well, some of that was scripted. I think he had some of the lines about the girl, bitch, need me in the nuts and all that. <laughs> <laughs> my nuts are halfway up my <laughs> ass. But otherwise, perfect. perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That I think I had But he was great like that. So he kind of set that scene and we just, you know. What's the what's the, your, your favorite, if you had to look back at one part, if you just could only take one part that you've done? Oh, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. If you had to take one part. And my, my favorite? Uh, this movie, Halloween Kills, man. How you, about that? you like that segue, Ryan? <laughs> I like it. But by the way, I've I, never been more pumped. Honest to God, I've never been more excited. But I think everybody's yeah. pumped about this movie. It's I really ass. think that it's just like it's kicking ass it right is. now. And where can we watch it? Okay, it's in theaters. Number it, one it, movie in the country. Uh, I think we got bumped this weekend by Dune, which did great. But it's made over like 90 million worldwide in 10 days. It's but crazy. But by the way, it's I bet it's film. a lot shorter than Dune. Was doing a, a weekend. It was a long movie. Did it take nine hours? It to was get two there? hours and forty minutes. It was a good. It was a good movie. But I'm just saying, Halloween something you could probably watch. It's not that. It's not too. It long. looks good. I want to see Dune. No, Halloween kicks ass. It's an hour and forty five minutes, and it's just a fucking roller coaster. I mean, it is. And it's how's really, Jamie Lee Curtis? She's awesome. Is she really? I hear she's awesome. No, no, she really is. I mean, when I think of Jamie, like I was in love with her as a kid, man. When I first saw the first one, Trading Places, I always loved Jamie Lee Curtis. I had a huge crush on her. I met her and her great husband when, when I was a kid, Chris Guest, another genius. I love this guy, man, Chris Guest. Oh, he's genius. He really is. He loves his movies. Waiting for Guffman. Oh, dude. Everything. Right? Best in show. Yeah. So I had the pleasure of meeting them when I was a kid. Um, but she's awesome. She's super chill and down to earth and you know has a great heart. She has this nonprofit called My Hand in Yours. Right. And she, which benefits Children's Hospital of LA. And she's just a cool lady. You know, she's got they have a couple of kids and you know, she's writing a project. I think she's going to direct a film for, with Jason Blum's company, Blum House. She's going to put you in it? I hope so, man. But she's awesome. She really is. She has a lot of heart and really cares about people, man. You can really see it. It cuts through, you know? She's well, you really do cool. pretty much in terms of, not, I'm not saying everything, but you'll, if you like a script or if you like a project, you'll do it, whether it's horror, whether it's comedy, whether it's drama, you just have to like it, but you, you love to work. I do, man. I do. And I like mixing it up. I think one of the things I've I've enjoyed just watching some of the greats that we both admired, I'm sure, growing up. I mean, like, I love Ben Kingsley, for example. Oh, yeah. Like, Sir Ben Kingsley, man, will go light to dark, right? Like House of Sand and Fog and then Sexy Beast, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> yes, amazing. <laughs> He's incredible. I could see you playing an absolute psychopath, like, really. I have. I mean, in what? <laughs> I did this movie called War Machine a couple of years ago, and it was with Brad Pitt. That was a lot of fun. I played a general. I mean, it was based on- Oh, you did play a psycho. Yeah, well, well, he was a tough general. It was a crazy general. I mean, I, that was just my choice. You know, We were playing real generals, but it was in part fictionalized. It was a project that Brad's company produced. Um, it was based on a book called The Operators. Great project. You know, So that was fun. So I played kind of- I played my general kind of like a jarhead, like he was a Marine general or something. So I mean, I've had a lot of fun playing villains, you know? Yeah. And Pirates of Silicon Valley, though, I, I just remember watching how you transformed yourself into Bill Gates. Thanks, man. And yeah. it just, it just, it blew me away. It Dude, truly. Have you ever you. seen it, Ryan? No. What the fuck? I know. I mean, I, you you <laughs> won't believe it. It's one of those things where you watch, you're like, because I, I think you were nominated for it, weren't you? Yeah. No, I appreciate it. No, the film was. It was nominated for five Emmys. I think it was a great experience, man. Yeah. Noah yeah. Wiley, great guy to work with. He really looked like Steve Jobs too, man. He was great. Would you do anything for a role in terms of gaining 30 pounds, losing 20 pounds, whatever? I kind of did for Halloween Kills, man. I was just in the South. I mean, I was trying to hit the gym. I was in there every morning for about a half hour. <laughs> really? Just- <laughs> but, then, but then I was eating like an animal, man. Good old Southern you, you food. You have to. Yeah, but I, it kind of worked for that too. And I decided to shave my head, which is, no, I'm sticking with this haircut because now- It looks good. Thanks, man. So- uh 
No, for that, yeah, I wanted to kind of just beef up a little bit, but I was eating good, man. North Carolina was fun. All right, this is called Shit Talk, and this is the kind of the end of the interview where it's, it's shit talking with uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Uh, my patrons, my lovable patrons, they get to ask some questions. And Great. You, just, you, you answer them. Let's That's do it, it, man. Yeah. Leanne, really loved your character on the Goldbergs. Any behind the scene pranks, funny moments you would like to share? Well, just Wendy McClub. Uh, Wendy, what, what was her? I'm sorry. Wendy McClendon? I yeah, can't go ask me. I forget Fuck, how you I say her name. Forgive me, Wendy. Brilliant comedic actress. She's the, I mean, she carries the show, but um, Jeff Garland, all those people are fantastic. We lost Mr. Siegel. He was brilliant. But everybody, all the kids on the show, I love doing that show. And it's a lot of fun too, kind of poking fun of the 80s. The writing's great. I have a great time on it. So they brought me on to do a, an episode. It was a goof. It was a spoof of Vacation. And right. the joke was that Rusty was now a security guard at, at Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. And then after that, they brought me on as a, I'm a guidance counselor, Mr. Parrott. So I've done about six episodes now. I think I'm doing another one this month. So, so you got a good Love sense of humor. You, yeah. you could easily play, make fun of yourself. That's the, oh, that's that's key, the key, man. That's that the is key. key. What did you, you say to me when I got here? If you can't do that. That's it. That's it. And that show gave me a great opportunity to do that because it's great. It makes fun of everything 80s, which is great. I love it. Yeah, Steph man. A, who was the most similar to their character in Breakfast Club? At the time, maybe. Ringwald. Really? Maybe. Dave P., any 80s Brat Pack movie you'd like to see modernized? Hmm. I don't think it would work. I, yeah, I can't speak. The first thought I had was not any of John's films. It was I actually thought of Fast Times, but you couldn't remake that. Remember how great Sean was oh, in that movie? Man, Come on, dude. It was all the characters. Mr. Head. You dick. You dick. You knock when you enter, Curtis. <laughs> Remember Entree. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to go over to London and party with Mick and Keith. Oh, dude, that movie is great. That movie is a great movie. Yeah. Uh, and I love when what's her name? Phoebe Cates comes out of the pool and he's jerking off in the, oh, in the bathroom. Another great moment. Yes. Carly, to your relationship with John That's Hughes. That's Mrs. Kevin Klein to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Watch him, will you? Uh, you know, we are, Carly, you we already answered that question. Me too. All this shit happened. He has no idea, does he? <laughs> Michelle no, K., who is the one person you would love to work with again? Downey. We have something that we're writing. Uh, a project and working with he and his wife the last couple of years is great. So we're still working on it. We're still working on it. We have a TV show that we wrote, actually. I would love that. What's the TV show? Yeah. You can't tell what it's about. I can't. I can't. It, you know, it's interesting because it's it's called Singularity. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it's something we've been working on. It's uh, Hopefully, we'll, we'll bring it to air. Dana asks, super geeked with you. This guy, super, Dana is super geeked on you. The new Hollywood, the new movie Halloween Kills, being up front with Michael Myers, was that face scary as hell or what? As a child up to right now, he still freaks me out. Yeah. Was it even scary while you were acting? It wasn't scary. It wasn't scary, but I mean, we have such great, let me just talk about the crew for a second. This guy, yeah. Chris Nelson, Christopher Nelson designs the mask. He's awesome. James Jude Court, he's a great guy. But we kind of left each other alone during the making of the film just to kind of give each other space so we could vibe out on the scenes. But we've become friendly since making the film. Cool guy. Great cinematographer. We had Michael Simmons, this guy who shot the movie. It looks incredible. But David Gordon Green, dude, I, honestly, he just kicks so much ass. This movie is like, I'm so proud of it. And the fact that I can say I'm working for Danny and, and David and James. Was and Danny, Danny on set? He was for the first week, dude. I'm a huge Danny McBride Did you guys just fan. talk forever? We did. We vibed out. He was so funny. You know, he said something to me in passing. I was giving him a compliment about his comedy. I love him. And he goes, use the force, Luke, or some shit like that. It was hilarious. <laughs> he's like, use my force. He said something like that. Use my but force. But he's super chill. He's so down to earth. Yeah. He's a great guy. He's Dude, really what funny. a great comedian, right? To me, he's like the modern day Bill Murray. I, I think he's one of the funniest guy. humans. Him and Kristen Wiig are like the two funniest people Oh, my people God. In the world. And Kate McKinnon, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's so many good comedians. Brilliant. Yeah. By the way, I, I have to mention it because I'm a big fan of Six Pack from 1982, but you work with Kenny you Rogers. You fucking lie for a living. You don't love Six Pack. Kenny Rogers, dude. Six Pack. You didn't like the Six Pack. I love Six Pack. I have it on VHS. You weren't watching the Family Fair. In 1980, we. I bet I have it up here. Somewhere. Actually, you were probably like nine years old. I was like 12 when I made the film. Yep. So do you really remember watching that film? I, I'm a billion percent. Oh I love God. Six Pack. I love that movie. Kenny Rogers was a great guy, man. He was an awesome guy. What a sweetheart. He loved us all, man. He was so cool. Did he general. ever play guitar for you and sit there and sing to you? No, but he had like he would he would take us up on helicopter rides and he had the, the rap party at his house. Just really great stuff. He was a Lady. really. Dude, he was awesome. What a nice oh, guy. Oh, man. And, and Diane Lane in it, too. Diane She's awesome. Lane. Oh, man. Loved her. I know. Beautiful Diane woman. Diane Lane. I right, fell lastly, in love with her. I loved her when I was I, a kid. Remember A Little her. Romance, that movie? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. I think that was the first You know crush. Diane Lane? Yeah. Oof, what was that movie where- He doesn't she, know anything before what, 2012. What, was, over here. what is he, 21? What was, How old is this kid over here? What was the movie where Richard Gere <laughs> kills the guy that she's having an affair with? 
Do you remember that one? No, no, no. Was it? Uh, oh my God! That she was did a, movie a dark with, movie was with it? Richard Gere. You have to yeah. see that. It is an amazing it. turn of events, and she is the drop dead gorgeous. It still is beautiful yeah. woman. Yeah, and so, a really nice person too. Very. Sweet. By the way, you know everybody always asks this question. It's not like you would fucking know. You wouldn't know the answer. To I this. don't know much. But Michael Scheffling, the most gorgeous guy in the history of cinema, who does one role in Sixteen Candles, the the heartthrob hunk, yeah, and then he disappears and he moves to the East Coast to be a carpenter. Literally, he's like he was like the J D. Salinger of actors. Great guy. We were great friends. We actually hung out a lot. He was a cool dude, man. And I I miss him. I haven't seen him since. In Do you like ever want to look years. him up and say, "What are you yeah, doing, Mario? dude? I actually met one of his kids. His, you know, he he was cool. He was such a good guy. He did Vision Quest with Matthew Modine, and then Vision after that, Quest. he just took another. He just went another route, man. Great guy. And you though. never heard from him again. Never heard from him again. No, he literally did a Salinger. I think he. Just I just, went. but that, that that takes balls to be in a fucking absolute hit of a movie, being the heartthrob and saying, "I'm walking." Oh, totally. I couldn't have done that. Could you have done that? No. I don't think no. I obviously, obviously <laughs> didn't. I obviously didn't do it. I've tried making furniture, right? It doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah, man, that always that always baffles but me. But he was he super balls. great guy, man. He really was. We were like buddies. Yeah, it was funny because I was such a young kid, but he and I hung out all through the making of the film when we weren't shooting. Isn't that great? Yeah, and then Hughes, same thing. Hughes was thirty five years old, man, at the time, and I was fifteen, and we were like best friends. Honest to God, it was the best. He was awesome. Yeah, he really was, man. Halloween Kills. It's everywhere. It's out in theaters. You it's gotta, on Peacock. You yep. got to go see it. It's on Peacock? It's on the cock. It's on the cock, guys. <laughs> uh, you got to see it. It's Halloween. What else are you going to do with your lives? This is what we do. We watch horror movies during the month of October. I know you're going to see Halloween Kills. And also, let me just say a personal thank you to everybody who's seen it, because people are seeing it like three, four, five times. I mean, it's amazing. It's wow. almost it's over 90 million bucks in like 10 days. So it's very humbling, really exciting. Well, I'm super, super happy pumped. for you. Thanks, brother. And you deserve it. You've done such a, a, a great amount of work. You got such a great body of work. Thank you, brother. I want to see you continue. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about the dead zone. We didn't even talk about so many projects, great projects. We'll you do it ran. again. Yeah. But, uh, you know, love to work with you sometime. Likewise, man. man. It would be Likewise. a lot of fun. And thank you, uh, Anthony Michael Hall, for allowing me to be inside of you today on the podcast good being with you and i know you you listen to the podcast i I do man i'm a fan we've known each other for years yeah it's been a long time i'm happy for your success you're doing great thanks man thanks for being here appreciate it i really uh, enjoyed that that interview he i mean talk about shuffling the guy who played jake in 16 candles and what he's doing and that they used to hang out and how he how anthony uh michael hall improvised and uh, on different sets with John Hughes and just the great relationship they had. Just, yeah. uh, just a far out, yeah. far out story. Yeah. What did you enjoy about it? Uh, he seemed to be acutely aware that I was right next to him. <laughs> he did. <laughs> so- he acknowledged you. He acknowledged your presence quite frequently. <laughs> it was like him and Rooker. It was a very similar Yes, but, they like yeah. to they like to sass you. So does yeah. Bobby Lee. Bobby Lee, it's Lee. Yeah, yeah. People like to sass you. Yeah, but I'm uh, very but, close to them, and it's yes. a little unnerving. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, you're close to the guest. I mean, not that close. You're a couple of feet, but uh, nonetheless, you're still. I mean, my notepad. Uh, another shout out to our stage at coming up. If you want to hear me play some music, the album is out. Sunspin is the band. You can go to sunspin.com. We're playing November 20th virtually. Two shows, 2 p.m., 6 p.m. Please. Uh, spread the word and show up and there's zooms to be had and prizes and we play some good music some covers uh my good buddy tom lally from left on laurel is going to join us as a a guest surprise although it's not a surprise now and um also if you want to um give back to echoes of hope uh you know there's a holiday event for under-resourced children teens and young adults 300 students will be supported this december uh, a lot of them don't have anywhere to go and uh, are, are uh, missing out on a lot in life, and they could use your help. And you can help them by going to at our Echoes of Hope on social media, and uh, you could give back. You could donate. Uh, you could do a lot of. There's a lot of different options. Go to echoesofhope.org to see more options and uh, help those guys out. Help those uh, fine folks out. Uh, Echoes of Hope, fine charity. Um, also, a shout out to Ronald McDonald House and foodonfoot.org. Uh, other cherries that I help. <coughs> help out with. Oh God! You okay? All right, you're right. See, uh, if people are listening. I, I could have just blamed that on you. <laughs> you know, I could say, "You okay, Ryan?" And they would have known. But if they're watching, they could see what you're that trying I to do. No, I didn't. It wasn't. It, no. wasn't, it wasn't COVID, Ryan. I know. You know, of anyone, you're not going to get it. Knock on wood, dude. Knock on wood Fucking... right now. Is that wood? 
This is wood. All right. Well, shit, man. Uh, yeah, I love it. And, you know, I think it's time to give a shout out to our top tiers. We know those guys on Patreon, patreon.com slash inside to give back a little more to the podcast, some a lot more to the podcast. They keep it going. They help uh, keep this train going. So here we go. Big shout out. And thanks again to Anthony Michael Hall, my guest today. Ryan, thanks for being here with me. No problem. Nancy D, Leah S, Trisha F, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Mama Lauren G, Nico P, Jerry W, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, not to be confused with. Kristen Crook. Amelia O, Allison L, Raj C, Joshua D, Emily S, CJ P, Samantha M, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jen S, Jamal F, Janelle B. Kimberly E, Mike E, Eldon, Supremo, 99 more, Ramira, Santiago M, Sarah F, I love all these people, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, correct, Chris H, Dave H, Spider-Man Chase, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Horada, Tabitha T, Michelle K, what up, Michelle, what up, Michael S, Talia M, Betsy D, Claire, uh, I don't know what that is, I think that's Claire i it's it's a it's a sideways print it's like a parentheses a backslash yeah uh, no whatever it is laura l chad l rochelle nathan e marion meg k janelle p trav l dan n big stevie w kendall t angel m rhiannon rhiannon rings like a bell through the night and would you love to love her Corey K, Super Sam, Coleman G, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Liz I, Jeremy C, Andy T, Cody R, Sebastian K, Gavinator, Anne H, David C, John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille S, Bano, Bono. I think it's Bono, don't you? B A N O. Bano. Maybe Bano. Bano. The C, Joey M, Willie F, Christina E, Adelaide N. Jeffrey M, Omar I, Lena N, Design OTG, Eugene and Leah. Hi, Eugene and Leah. I didn't leave you out this time. Uh, I hope it's not Lee. Maybe it's Eugene and Lee. Did I, did, I, did I F it up again? Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, KTB, Patricia, Marissa, Maria N, and Bradley S. Bradley S. Uh, you guys really helped the podcast out, and I really appreciate you. Thanks for listening today. It's been a real treat having you. I hope you're enjoying the holidays. Make sure you go uh, watch us and stage it. If you haven't seen a stage it performance, please get tickets, sunspin.com or stage it.com. Type in sunspin. We'll be there. We'll be playing. Um, the store is available for merch at the Inside of You online store and sunspin.com. You can get T-shirts and a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, there you go. Ryan? There you go. Good seeing you. Good seeing you too. Thank you all for allowing me to be inside of you today. Once again, thanks for having me uh, as part of your drive or your life or whatever that is. And uh, so many emails, so many uh, comments of how much the show means to them. And it means a lot to me that you uh, you feel that way. And that's why I keep doing it. So uh, thanks. And uh, from the Hollywood Hills up in here in Los Angeles, California, I'm Michael Rosenbaum. Hello, Brian. Tales of them. Guys. Keep rocking in the free world. Have a good week. Rocking in the free world.